amazing. Thank you so much for having me, Kind Body. Um, I think that, you know, I've obviously had my own fertility journey, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but knowing that there are places where LGBTQ plus people and especially trans people can go to have their questions answered in a space that feels welcoming and inclusive and supportive of them and also talk to providers who are actually knowledgeable um, uh, is just really, really wonderful. And, and it's been such a privilege to get to partner with you to, to help build those inclusive systems. Um, sometimes it can feel like we're going backward in terms of trans rights, and that's true in some ways, but also it's not true um, because organizations like Kind Body um, are doing everything that you can to help provide fertility care regardless of gender identity. So yeah, thank you so much for the work that you're doing, and thanks to everyone for being with me today. Um, so we came up with this workshop because it became really clear to Kind Body and to me that there are just really not a lot of spaces where people can ask their questions about trans people, trans issues, get some skills, learn about allyship, get a sense of like, what can you be doing? What questions should you be asking? What does non-binary mean anyway? And how is that different from pansexual? So we're gonna answer all of those questions today um, with lots of opportunity for you to ask your unique questions in addition to what I have prepared. Um, so I would actually really love it if folks could hop in the chat and just tell me where you are joining from. So I have a sense of who is out there. We already have over 50 people. Um, I'm in Portland, Oregon. And so uh, it's just always nice for me to know how, how connected I am to other people um, around the country and sometimes around the globe. So they, you know, that happens as well. Amazing, Austin. Oh, don't talk to me about Austin, Emma, because I was supposed to be in Austin last month and of course it got canceled because of the pandemic. So I'm feeling very, I have a lot of feelings about Austin right now. Um, Brooklyn, amazing, I used to live in bed -Stuy, so that's great. Queens, San Francisco, Jersey City. Lauren is in Brooklyn, but is from Portland, hey. Long Island, Manhattan, Yamhill, Oregon, nice. Um, yes, Emma, I really wanna come back to Austin. I really wanna come back to Austin. Um, amazing, Toronto, that's great. I'm Canadian by birth, so. Canada is the motherland for me, so welcome, so happy you're here. Um, so we have an hour together, um, and even though that's not a lot of time, um, I still want to ground us in um, sort of my approach to the work and, and what I hope that you all will come away with. And I think it can really be summed up by this poem that I found, the little portion of a larger poem. Um, it goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act, it starts when you say we and know who you mean, and each day you mean one more. And so this is something I bring into my own allyship work when I'm in allyship with transgender women, when I'm in allyship with people of color, when I'm in allyship with elders and, and people living with disabilities. Um, I just try to think like, what can I do today? I just try to think about like, what can I do? How can I act? How can I be differently? Um, it starts with thinking about the we, the inclusive whole, but then also always trying to expand that work. So that's where I always like to start is with this little poem from this, uh, this poet. Um, yeah. And so here's me and my baby. I just can't, look at his little face. I love him so much. <laughs> um, so I'm Tristan, I live in Portland, as I mentioned. Um, I have the incredible privilege of getting to do this work um, this work of building a more radically inclusive world um, for my living. Um, I'm a consultant, I work with organizations, I work with people, um, I do storytelling online, um, I do all kinds of things. If you are a Squarespace customer, um, you will have actually seen my face in your inbox today because apparently Squarespace sent an email about me today. <laughs> um, so it's really cool to be able to do this work. Um, I just imagine that all of my ancestors would have given anything to have this many people who are open and ready and excited to learn. Um, and also they're really, you know, as I mentioned, there aren't a lot of spaces where we can be humble and we can make mistakes. And so that's my goal today is that you can ask all the questions that you wanted to ask, but were too embarrassed to put on Twitter because you didn't want to get canceled. That's what I'm here for. Um, uh, it's both a privilege, um, but I also feel like it's my responsibility. You know, I'm, I'm a transgender person myself um, and, and I have so many privileges being a transgender man. I have so many privileges being a white person. I have so many privileges being someone that isn't read by the world as transgender unless 
I'm pregnant and in the news, which is, I think, actually my very next slide. There it is. Um, and so I feel like it really is my responsibility um, to get to do this work. And so that's what I'm here for today. Um, and so that's sort of where this session really starts, um, is with my story. Um, I am a transgender man. I chose to get pregnant and carry my baby, who was on my last slide. Look at his little cheeks. So I gave birth to him myself. Um, and my story ended up blowing up in a way that I could never have imagined that it would because I am in my little trans bubble where transgender men having babies is like a thing that happens all the time. It's been happening for at least 20 years as far as I know. My friend Matt, his son Blake is 21. So at least 20 years, transgender men have been having babies. This didn't seem like a big thing to me, but apparently it tapped into some larger assumptions that people have about what it means to be transgender, what it means to be a man, what it means to be pregnant. Um, and so I've really just tried to take advantage of that attention and that moment um, to push for a sustained conversation about transgender people, transgender families, transgender lives, gender in general. Um, and so uh, that's sort of what frames a little bit of our conversation today. I don't think it should be a big deal for a man to have a baby. It's not a big deal in my world. And yet, outside of my bubble, it is a big deal. Um, and so maybe you saw this story, maybe you had a bunch of questions about how this could happen, how do I reconcile being pregnant and being a man, uh, and I think a lot of that we're going to cover today. So to begin, pop in the chat and tell me, what are the things that you want to learn more about when it comes to the trans community? What, are, what, what is on your spirit today? What is on your mind today? Um, what are you hoping that I get to? Um, this is helpful for me so I can calibrate my curriculum as we go. It's also really useful because I wanna know at the top who I'm gonna let down so I can just manage your expectations because I can't get to everything in an hour. Um, and sometimes if you have a question and you're waiting for me to get to it, it's hard to listen to the other stuff. So just pop in the chat and let me know, what are you hoping to learn more about? What are you hoping that I cover today? Um, what, uh, what's, what's, what's on your mind? I should have had uh, cold music here. Instead, I'm just gonna take a sip of my LaCroix, like a, like a millennial. And I'll wait for your questions to come in. Great. You can totally send those to me privately, as some folks are. You can send them to everyone. No pressure at all. So it does look like people just want to know, you know about allyship, how to take action, how to navigate conversations with an old friend you haven't seen since their transition. And it's been years. Great. No problem. Cool. Well, so far, everything that I see, yes, I'm going to get to it. So. Could be good. What are appropriate ways to ask for pronouns? Amazing. And um, for my tech person, who I think is Sam, I am hearing someone. So maybe you could just make sure everyone is muted except for me. That would be great. Okay, cool. So these are all questions we are 100% going to get to, and I'll try to hold some time sacred at the end as well so that I can tackle anything that, that comes up that I didn't address. So to our time today, I'm really going to think about three things in the hour that we have. So first, we're going to look at what I call the four pillars of identity. And that is the four things that are going to come into play when we talk about sexual orientation and gender identity and trans identity. So that's where we're going to start. So we have some shared language. These are the generally accepted terms in the community. So that'll also give you a place to start from when you're talking to an old friend that you haven't seen since college, when you are building inclusive policies, um, someone's HR. Um, so this, that's, that's where we're going to start. Um, then we're going to go, we're going to take a little detour. We're going to talk about gender neutral pronouns. This is one of the most common practical skills that I get asked about um, all the time. And I'm not someone who uses gender neutral pronouns. I use he, him, his. And so I also feel like it's an opportunity for me to be an allyship with non-binary people, people who use gender neutral pronouns. I can do some of the emotional labor to teach people so that they don't have to. Um, and then finally, we're gonna talk about some concrete ways that you can be in allyship with transgender people. Um, and then we'll also try to keep some time for questions at the end and keep those questions coming as well in the chat. I'll answer them as we go or I'll put a pin in them uh, for the end. Um, all right, great. So starting with the pillars of identity. For those of you who, for whom this is not new, um, I really just encourage you to view this with an educator's 
apply. Because if you're someone for whom this is not new, you're probably someone that people come to all the time for advice. You know, someone says like they're already an ally and a supporter publicly. Um, people probably come to you to say like, how do I do this or what does this mean? So use this if it is helpful for you. So we're gonna look at four different elements of identity. We're gonna start with assigned sex at birth. Now, that is the preferred language right now. Um, maybe like 10 years ago when I first started doing this work, we would say that someone was biologically male or biologically female or born a boy or born a girl. We don't use that language anymore. And for the nerds out there, I definitely do some more advanced trainings where I talk about why we don't say biologically male or biologically female. Um, it's super complicated. Biology is really complicated. Complicated. That's why we don't use it anymore. Now we talk about your assigned sex at birth, and that's quite simply what was on your birth certificate that a doctor or midwife um, put on there based on usually your visible external anatomy. So that's your assigned sex. Because I've been doing this work for a long time and because I work with a lot of physicians, uh, scientists, researchers, academics, sometimes people say like, what's coming next, you know, what's on the horizon, I expect within the next three years, I'm going to be teaching five pillars of identity. And that sex traits is actually going to be pulled out as its own pillar. So right now, I, I put them together. Um, but basically here, we're thinking about your birth certificate or what body parts, genetics you are born with. Usually in our modern culture, our Eurocentric culture, that's thought of as either male or female. But like all of these things, there is no, there is no black and white. There's just a bunch of gray. Um, but that's usually what we think about is assigned sex at birth or sex traits are largely male or female. Okay, next, gender identity. So this is your internal knowledge of who, what your gender is, who you are. Usually this starts to show up between ages three and five. Those of you who follow me on Instagram will see that I posted a picture of my toddler who's three wearing makeup that my nine-year-old put on him. He does not seem to have a gender identity yet. He just like wears whatever we put him in, dresses in whatever the nine-year-old gives him. But I bet in the next year or so, he's going to start showing a bit of a preference one way or the other. That's when it starts to show up. And again, in our modern culture, this is not true in, in most indigenous cultures globally, but in our modern culture, we generally are set up to think about gender identity as being black or white, man or woman, one or the other. But now, of course, we're opening up as a culture. We're, having a, a, we're remembering the way that things have been globally in terms of gender, and we're seeing that this is much more of a spectrum than we were taught. And what that does is it opens up more space for people to live more authentic lives. So rather than approaching this opening up um, as something to be feared or to think that it's like a fad or a trend, I just try to think about it as being really excited because when people are more authentically fully themselves, they're able to bring more of who they are to the world. That means more scientists searching for the cure to coronavirus. It means more teachers able to meet students more profoundly where they are. Uh, it means more uh, CEOs uh, able to create products and businesses and services that are going to serve even more people. We do our best work, all of us humans, when we're able to show up fully and authentically. And this embrace of this as a spectrum is only going to make people more free to be able to bring their, their best selves to everything that they do. Um, someone is asking if this presentation will be accessible after the workshop. I actually don't know. Um, and so at the end, we can uh, touch base with Kind Body to see if it's going to exist right now, um, or uh, if it's something that you're lucky that you're here, and after it's gone, it's gone forever. I'm just kidding. Um, so we'll, we'll figure that part out. So then next, we get into gender expression, which is quite simply how we tell the world what our gender identity is. Generally, this too is a spectrum with sort of more masculine on one side, more feminine on the other, whole spectrum inside there. Um, and what else do I want to say about that? I think that's pretty clear. You, you can see already that these are all, you know, they're parallel to each other um, and they exist independently of each other. And so someone can be a man and be feminine, of course. Someone can be male and be, uh, you know, have been assigned male sex at birth and their gender identity is woman. You know, these, these are all independent things that play with each other but operate independently. The last one is just who, who we're interested in, um, not who we are, but who we like and who we want to be with. And I always still include this one because I think that we've come quite a long ways in understanding that some people are attracted to men, some people are attracted to women, and some people are attracted to both or neither. 
Um, and so I would still like to include that there because we've learned a lot, I think, about how people naturally show up attracted to either just one gender or more than one gender. Um, but if you go back even 30, 40 years, you'll see what they used to say about bisexual people. That's what they say about trans people now. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion that maybe they were just confused or they were trying to trick people or they needed to just pick a side. Um, we're seeing some of that same stuff happening here that they're somehow predatory. Um, I don't think a lot of, not to say that there's no biphobia, but we've moved past a lot of the worst parts of that. So that gives me hope that we will also move forward on trans issues as well. So if I put myself here, so I was assigned female at birth. I, I was born with typically female sex traits and I know myself to be a man. So because there's not an alignment there, I'm considered transgender. Transgender is just that umbrella term for anyone whose gender identity, what they know themselves to be is different than their assigned sex. So pop quiz, just put in the chat, what is the word used to describe someone whose assigned sex is in alignment with their gender identity? Christine, you win. I'm just kidding, it's not a contest. Um, great, so folks are already here. The word is cisgender. Um, if we were all in a room together, which is how I'm used to doing this work, I would call, I would call on one of you and make you say, what the prefix cis means and why we need this word. But since we're online, I won't put you on the spot. I'll just tell you. Um, so the word is cisgender, C-I-S, you can see in the chat. That prefix cis um, in biology it comes from Latin, Greek. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. But in biology, it means on the same side as. So there are trans fats and there are cis fats when talking about the way that a body processes the molecules of fat, whatever. Um, so it means on the same side as. Of. So it's just in alignment with and not crossing over, that's it. And that word cisgender is new. I fought it for a very long time because I don't like words that can feel um, inaccessible to people. I don't want anyone to feel dumb um, when I'm doing this work. And so sometimes I worry that we create these new words and we punish anyone who like isn't woke enough to know what they are. But I have accepted that cisgender is actually gonna stick around. Um, now I teach it, obviously. But the word was created because up until we had this word, we didn't have any way to describe someone whose body matches their gender. And what happens when we don't have a word to describe something is it's like, oh, you know, we have trans people over there and then we have normal people. The assumption can be that in fact, it's so normal to not be transgender. We don't even need a word for it. So this word was created um, to describe anyone who's not transgender. Um, and it's, it's value neutral. It's not an insult or anything like that. Um, and I see some questions about the sort of practicality of how to put this into work for, in an inclusive way, both from an HR perspective, as well as an interpersonal and a medical perspective. And when we get to the tools section at the end, I'm going to dig deep into some of those practical applications for this work. So don't worry, I see you. Um, so my gender expression, my partner and I had a bit of a debate about this last week when I was making this slide. Uh, my partner did not agree with where I put my gender expression, which I think, which I put my gender expression more in the middle. I see myself as being more androgynous and my partner was like, no, 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 no. So just a good reminder that sometimes our gender expression is um, subjective. What we think we put out in the world can be different than what other people see us as. Um, but, you know, I'm on the more masculine side, obviously not the manliest man ever. Um, and I'm solely attracted to men, have always been. Um, so I would call myself a gay transgender man. So those are the words that I would use to describe me. So I've, obviously I would not be considered a transgender woman. I say obviously that's, that comes with judgment. Um, no matter what you think is true, I'm not judging you for that at all. But to let you know, I would call myself a gay transgender man. I would not, you would not call me a transgender woman right? Because my gender identity is a man. And someone's asking for clarity around gender expression. And so that's how you tell the world what your gender is. It's the mix of um, gender cues that you send out. So that's like short hair, long hair, makeup, no makeup, gesticulate with your hands when you talk or not. Some of these things we have control over, like do we wear suits or dresses? Um, some of the things we don't have control over, like how tall we are, how deep our voice is, how big our hands are. Um, but that's that's how the world is perceiving or picking up the cues to figure out what our gender identity is. Um, so that's what the, the gender expression is. So I'm what it, people would call a binary transgender person because I have a gender identity that is on one end or another. I, I, I know myself to be a man. 
I'm not in that middle space. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I identify as a transgender man. So what we would then get to is like, let's look at some of those middle spaces. I talked a little bit about um, bisexual in that identity there. We'll touch on that one first because it's the one that we are most familiar with. Um, people who are not solely attracted to one gender or the other may call themselves any number of things because we are in the internet era where people get a chance to connect with a global community of people in their identity and they get to always shift and learn and grow and find new things, um, new ways of describing themselves, um, which is super cool and also very confusing. So here is where I would just wanna talk about your attitude around allyship, whether that's with anyone who's LGBTQ or just the trans community or whatever. The goal should never be to like know everything or to like not offend someone. Because spoiler alert, like you are definitely going to offend someone. What we know now about trauma is that trauma is like a bruise. You don't have to hit it very hard for it to hurt. And people have trauma around their identities. Regardless of where you live or what your experiences are, someone said like, you know, they don't see a lot of um, overt instances of transphobia. Even in whatever your bubble is, the trans people in your life, the bisexual people in your life, the LGBTQ people in your life are seeing and hearing overt and covert homophobia, transphobia all the time. And even if we are super grown, even if we have a therapist, there may still be those wounds there that are going to be tender. So when you use the wrong word or the wrong pronoun to describe someone, it may not seem like a big deal to you, but you're hitting a bruise, you're hitting on trauma. So you are definitely gonna offend someone, especially for the medical providers here, the HR folks. When you're having those complicated clinical discussions, those complicated employment discussions, you may use the words that I tell you to use and that person may be like, how dare you? I would never use that word to describe myself. So really your attitude should just be one of humility and openness. So if someone says like, oh, I'm not bisexual, I'm pansexual, instead of being like, well, Tristan told me, please don't do that because they will come for me on Twitter. Instead, to just get to that humble place. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. That was an assumption that I made. I shouldn't have done that. What word would you like me to use instead? That's it. Thank you so much for telling me. Sorry, I used the wrong word. And if there's an opportunity, I think it's okay when appropriate to say, to ask someone permission and say, I would actually love to know a little bit more. That's a new word for me. And I wanna make sure I'm supporting you as best as I possibly can. Do you feel able to or open to sharing with me a little bit more about what that word means for you? Um, I think for medical providers, that's gonna also be a super useful tool. Sorry, I used the wrong word. I'll use the right word from now on. And are you able to or do you feel comfortable sharing more? Um, and be ready for them to say no. Yeah, okay. So other middle spaces, gender expression. Um, this particular photo um, is someone whose gender expression um, is gender fluid, can oscillate between masculine and feminine. And the person, I'm actually going to put um, their name in the chat so you can see them. Their, their name is Rain Dove. And I highly recommend that you visit them on Instagram and follow them because they're doing really incredible work around gender and persuasion and talking to people who disagree with them. So. So generally speaking, people who have a gender expression that is either fluid or that is not in alignment with their gender identity, then they would be considered gender fluid or gender nonconforming. So drag queens are a great example of someone who's gender nonconforming. Most drag queens at all, most drag queens identify as men, so they are men in their day-to-day -day lives, and their gender expression is sometimes feminine, hyper-feminine. Right? So that is an example of what gender nonconforming means. Um, certainly people are women and dress, dress in masculine, what we would call masculine clothes, suits, ties, etc. cetera. Um, I would probably also say that uh, Janelle Monet, who we just saw in the last slide, who is bisexual, is also gender nonconforming because she consistently presents in a way that we would more associate with like the suits and the ties and the fancy shoes and, and all of that. Gender nonconforming, Prince, gender nonconforming, David Bowie, gender nonconforming. Um, so that's where that word gender nonconforming comes in. And, and some of the words that you, you also might hear might be androgynous, masculine of center, feminine of center. That's all talking about gender expression. And then we get into the like hot topic right now, which is non binary. 
Um, so I have some, I like, I'm like a really big nerd. And so we're going to talk about facts and data in this, just a second. Um, but a couple of things I want to just lay the groundwork for. So the word non-binary, that is also like cisgender, brand new, created very recently. Um, and, but the, the, the being in between man and woman, not identifying exclusively as a man or a woman, that's not new. That's existed throughout all of written and oral history. Um, so, so that's not new, but these words are new. And the word genderqueer was really the word that was preferred um, through the 80s and into the 90s. And for some older folks in this category, demographically speaking, genderqueer is still used. But very quickly, um, in terms of the data, non-binary has replaced genderqueer as a preferred term for people who are not men or women specifically, who see themselves as somewhere in between, above or beyond, or not having a gender at all, whatever. Um, okay, so the word is new, the concept is not new. And then what we also know, the person here is Amanda Stenberg, I'll put that in the chat too, so you can follow their work. Um, they are uh, an actor, they played Rue in the Hunger Games, if folks remember the Hunger Games movies. I just had to rewatch them because my kids are now old enough to watch them. Horrible, heartbreaking, very hard to watch, but that's Amanda Stenberg. Um, and they're also, if you have a teenager, they probably already know um, who Amanda Stenberg is because they make really amazing videos, um, uh, educational videos about uh, anti-blackness, racism, uh, LGBTQ issues, non-binary stuff. So they are a really amazing person to follow. Um, and they use gender neutral pronouns as well. Okay. So let's dig deep into this now because this is a question that I get quite a lot. So can folks just tell me in the chat, um, if you had to give yourself a grade, A through F, on your ability to successfully use gender neutral pronouns, meaning they, them, theirs, or something else other than he or she, for non-binary people. So if someone says, I use gender neutral pronouns, how are you doing on that? No judgment, you can send it to me privately if you don't want anyone to know. So of course, like F being brand new, have no idea, C being I'm trying, I'm doing a pretty good job, I still got more to learn. A being like you're mad that Kind Body asked me and not you to do this training. <laughs> I just like to know who's coming for my job. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Okay, fabulous. Well, I've only got one A and that's an A minus. So I appreciate your humility, Laura, and hopefully you will be able to um, uh, hang with us for this next part because this is gonna be just a super practical how do we do this? Um, all right, so some things to know before we get into the tool I'm gonna teach. Um, some cool things to know. Okay, so I only found this out last year and this comes from the National Trans Discrimination Survey, um, which was put out last in uh, 2015, 2016. One third of all trans people are non-binary. So there is like a third are transgender men like me, a third are transgender women like Laverne Cox or Janet Mock or Genesette Gutierrez or Caitlyn Jenner. A third are non-binary. And I think that's really important, especially for those of you who are coming from an HR or a medical perspective, because you have an opportunity to build more inclusive systems. And sometimes there is this myth that like, why should we spend all of this time giving a non-binary gender option on our intake forms or redoing our EMR system for people who identify as non-binary when it's like a tiny subset of a subset of a subset of a community. Of course, number one, it shouldn't matter how many people there are. It's still important to be inclusive. And number two, there are just as many non-binary people as they are. there are any other trans identity. So that can be a really useful tool when you're building consensus around building non-binary inclusive systems. So anyways, I think that that's pretty dope. And it's also really useful to know that almost all non-binary people also identify as trans. So like there's the trans umbrella, non-binary is a, is a subset included under that umbrella. Um, and so when, when you say you're providing trans inclusive care or when you're, you say you're doing trans inclusion training, almost all non-binary people feel that you're also talking about them. So what I say for people who are, are writers or who are de developing policies, you can say for transgender comma, non-binary comma, and gender non-conforming people, 
And then after that, you can just say trans. And most people feel like, yes, they're, they're talking about me. But only 3% of non-binary people are out to everyone in their lives as non-binary. 3%. 40% just don't even say anything if someone uses the wrong pronoun or makes an assumption. And only three are out to everyone in their lives. So if you th think that maybe, uh, okay, good, sorry, I thought I had a typo, which was, I can't have a typo, it will drive me crazy, but it's fine. Um, so if you think that you don't know anyone who's non-binary, you probably do, you just don't know it. And if you do know someone who's non-binary, like, that's great because that means that they trusted you with this information. And sometimes I think we get stuck in our allyship around like, oh, I'm failing, I'm doing a bad job, whatever, that's not useful. Um, and even knowing that someone felt safe enough to come out to you, that means that like you're already doing something well to be able to build that trust with them. Um, and then the last piece here, is that 80 to 90% of non-binary people, given their druthers, would use a pronoun other than he or she. So having this skill of using non, non, gender neutral pronouns is gonna be really useful. And the data does show us that more and more people are openly identifying as non-binary. There is a generational shift, there's a cultural shift. So this is gonna continue to be something that is practically going to be very, very useful in your work. Also, all trans people talk to each other all the time. And so if you are a doctor uh, that is showing this trans inclusive care, like more patients will come to you. Um, if you are an HR hiring director and you hire one trans person, like 10 more trans people will apply for those jobs. You are broadening your ability to welcome the best and the brightest from the rainbow family when you start to integrate in some of these practical, um, practical skills to your work. Um, okay, and then most of, most of the people that use a pronoun other than he or she use they or them. So, Thinking about your, your scores here, A through F, I appreciate your honesty, everyone, <laughs> for, uh, for saying, uh, for being honest about that. I'm glad you feel that I'm not gonna judge you and I'm really not, how would you know this? So let's talk about how to train your brain, um, how to actually, okay, well, this slide isn't where I want it to be. This is supposed to say retrain your brain here, but it's not showing up, it's okay. So what we're really talking about is neuroscience. I know, I told you I was a nerd. You didn't believe me. I'm going to prove it right now. The latest information we have about the way that our brain understands and processes language is that when we are learning a language, it is literally shaping our brain, not figuratively. The nooks and crannies of our literal brain structure are shaped by the language that we are, are raised using. So that means for your entire life, your brain has literally formed around looking at masculine people calling them he, looking at feminine people calling them she, looking at groups of people calling them they, or if you don't know, like, oh, someone left their bag here. That's how you use they. So you have to retrain your brain. You literally have to rewire your brain to use pronouns in this way. And I think that it's really useful to think about it that way because it's not that you don't care or that you hate trans people. It's just that it is hard. It is a literal process of retraining your brain. And Christine is asking, you know, is there an option for pronouns that are definitively singular? This is such a great question, you know, because often people are, you know, they get stuck in the grammar place of like, Ugh, you know, is, we're so used to using they, them for multiple groups of people, multiple people. So hard to now be like, they went to the store to get their eggs, and when they come back, they are going to make an omelet for our brunch. That can feel confusing or hard. But here's the problem. In the 80s and 90s, non-binary people who are called genderqueer back then created new pronouns. Z, zim, zir, or z, here, here, depending on where you were in the uh, ge geographically. They made up whole new program, pr pronouns, um, and I'll put them in the chat just so you can see what they look like. It's, it was like either Z, Zier, or Z slash here. About 2% of trans people still use what's called a neo pronoun, something other than that. So in the 80s and 90s, they came up with these pronouns and they were like, here you go. And then cisgender people were like, ah, I don't know. We gotta learn a whole new word. Can't you guys just like choose a word that we like already know and use all the time? So, non-binary slash genderqueer people were like, sure, fine. 
we, we will not use this anymore. Let's use something that everyone already knows. They, them, theirs, right? And now cisgender people are like, ugh, I don't know, guys. Can't you just like pick something new? Because we already have a meaning for these words. Do you see what I'm getting at here? It's like a catch-22. <laughs> and so now, because we're in a more advanced place culturally around trans issues and non-binary issues than we were when I came out, you know, in the dark ages, um, now non-binary people are gener generally are just like, listen, this is what we're picking. Y'all need to get with the program. And so it's really about adjusting your own understanding of the word. And it's just about practice and rewiring your brain to use them in this way, um, which is what we're about to talk about. And yes, like Webster's Dictionary, the, 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 the singular pronoun they, them, for, you know, as gender neutral, that's in the dictionary now. We have been doing this. Shakespeare did this when the gender of the person they were talking about was unknown. You know, someone left their bag here. Ask your teacher when you get to, this, when you get to class. Um, they can tell you, right? And so then it becomes practically, okay, how do I do it? Fine, I'm gonna do it. This is what people need to feel seen, heard, respected, et cetera. How do I do it? It really is about retraining your brain. And the great news about the neuroscience is that is around neuroplasticity. We can change our brains all the way up until they die. So even if my mom is like, I'm too old to use, to learn a new pronoun, I can be like, that's not true. You're never too old to use not wrong. I don't mean to pick on my mom. She's actually great and she can do this fine. It's taken her 20 years, but she can do it. So it then is just practically how do you do it? Oh yeah, haha, -ha, there's my between your brain. Okay, so here's the system that I've created super practically. So number one, it is really important to not go down a shame spiral. Because what happens is you, you really do need the neurons of your brain to loosen and find new connections. It is really hard to do that when you're in defense mode, right? There are like whole chunks of our brains which are literally set up to keep us from ever being wrong, to keep us from ever being called out, to keep us from ever being attacked, right? either physically or even like psychically or emotionally or professionally. And what can happen is that part of your brain when you make a mistake, floods you with all those fear <laughs> hormones, and then you get stuck in this shame spiral, which makes it impossible to learn and grow. So it's really important to see yourself as like, you're not a bad person, you are a person on a journey, you are learning, that's it. And it's gonna take time, you're rewiring your damn brain. Like that doesn't happen overnight. I'm so sorry, I used profanity, I apologize. I will not do that again. Um, so it's gonna take time. You need to give yourself grace. Because A, your brain needs it so that you can keep getting better and not regress. And also B, the trans and non-binary people in your life may not have the capacity, the ability, the time, the patience to give you the grace and forgiveness that you need. It's also not their job. It's like not their job to make you feel better about not quite being where you wanna be and where you're holding yourself accountable to be but you need it. So you need to do it for yourself so that, other tra so that trans people do not have to. So that's like the first thing. And then the second thing is, if you do make a mistake, just correct it and move on. So do not throw yourself an apology parade. Do you know what I'm talking about? When people are like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I used the wrong pronoun for you. It's just that you're pregnant. And usually like, I'm just so used to working with women. Stop it. Because what you're doing when you do that is you're shifting the focus back onto yourself. So instead of repair, forgiveness is being asked. And so me as a trans person, then instead of being like, oh, you know, thank you for recognizing you made a mistake. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate that you're still learning. Instead, all I am now like, oh, no, 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 it's totally okay, like I get it. I'm now apologizing to you and making you, what is this? So don't throw an apology parade. Just like, oh, so sorry, I mean he, and then just keep moving. And then, super practically, your brain does not know the difference between you speaking and your conscious voice. So you can, should, must, in your head, start using gender neutral pronouns when thinking about non-binary folks. I used to do this literally like when I was on the commuter train to work every day, it's called the MAX in Portland, and as I would sit on the train, I had a colleague, a staff member that I had hired, 
named Joe who's non-binary. And I'm like, oh my God, what if I mess up Joe's pronouns, right? So I would sit on the max and on the way to work every day, I would literally just think using my conscious internal voice, I'm really excited to see Joe at work today. They always wear these amazing ties. They brought those delicious cookies last week. They're such a great colleague. I love working with them. Just making new connections. Joe, them, they, them. Same thing works if your college friend changed their name because they transitioned. You like think about that person they were, and you think about them with the new name, with the new pronoun. So maybe they were your best guy friend in college. Now they are, you know, now they identify as a woman or living, are living as a woman. So like she was so fun to be in theater with. She was so good at the sonnets when we were learning Shakespeare. Um, her parents were super mean. And so she stayed over at my house a lot, whatever it is new name, new pronoun, any, anything you need to make a shift in your brain around, just practice, because your brain doesn't know the difference between out loud and in your head. Um, and that's how you'll make those new connections. And this is like riding a bike. You learn how to do it, you never have to learn it again. That's it. And in fact, you get there are like even deeper, more advanced stages of this, where like I've had friends change their name and a week later I'm using their new name and I can't even remember what their old name was. Or I do a lot of work with LGBTQ plus people who are incarcerated. Uh, often their legal name, which I see like when I'm emailing them through the prison system, is different than their, ch their chosen name. I will see David and in my head I will think Raven. So the brain is amazing. It can do so much cool stuff. And this is just like super easy, super practical. You just practice it and then it'll come out of your mouth the right way. If you don't go down a shame spiral and if you get excellent at making it right um, when, when you make a mistake. Does that make sense to folks? This, this sort of like a, a tool, very practical, do it in your head so you don't have to get embarrassed saying it out loud. Great. And then it is just practice. That's it. You just have to do it enough to get used to it. Um, Okay, great. And I do have a video on this that's on YouTube if you wanna like share this with your friends or like be revisited. It's just me doing this exact same thing that I just did. Um, and so uh, maybe I can ask a kind body to send that out afterwards so that way you just have it and you can send it to your mom or whoever else is still trying to learn. Um, okay, great. What next? Okay, so here are three non-binary people. Sam Smith is in the corner. They are a very well-known singer. Um, who came out as non-binary this year. Um, next to Let's Practice is India Moore, and they are a non-binary actor. They're the star of Pose. Um, and then we have Amanda Stenberg as well, who we know as Rue from Hunger Games, who's done a lot of other amazing work too. It's just that that's the most accessible reference um, for people who come to these workshops. When I talk to high schoolers, I do a lot of work in high school. <laughs> they're like, we haven't watched The Hunger Games. And then I'll be like, oh, they were also in The Hate You Give. And they're like, oh yeah, we know that. So anyways, I uh, have to always, <laughs> always adjust my references for the kids. Um, so just pop in the chat. Even if you don't know who any of these people are, just pick one and you can say like, they have really gorgeous hair or I love that song that they do. Just like put a sentence using a gender neutral pronoun into the chat so you get just get started doing it and while you're doing that i will say um a couple of other things i've heard i have heard that people will um refer to their pets using gender neutral pronouns so that they get uh, just practice in a low stake situation so that you can say like uh, um it looks like their bowl is empty whose job was it to feed marley they don't have any water they don't have any food whatever. So you can just practice in your house. That's a low stakes way of practicing. Pets don't have genders, so they won't care. Um, there's something else I was going to say there, but it's gone now. Maybe it'll come back. Okay, great. Looks like you all have got it. All right. Oh my gosh, we have 15 minutes left. I've already been talking so fast. I recognize that it's sometimes hard to process when someone's speeding through, um, but I want to do as big a brain dump on you all as possible. Um, so yeah, let's keep moving. Um, the final thing I'll say here um, is, again, often people ask me because I do a lot of speaking, um, because I do a lot of thinking about queer stuff. A lot of people ask me, like, what's the next trans? You know, what's the next issue community that we should be paying attention to now that's going to become even more, um, even more of a focus in the future? Um, and it's intersex people. Um, truly, 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 I'm just like, if 
if things weren't as wild as they were, and if there hadn't been so many rollbacks of trans protections, I would be doing, I would be doing 100% of my work in allyship with the intersex community. I wouldn't even be worrying about trans stuff. We're not there, fine. But um, intersex is the, used word, the word used to describe anyone whose physical body, their biology, falls in between medical definitions of male or female. Um, the very old, very offensive word that you should never use, that used to be used to describe intersex people was hermaphrodite. Do not use that word, it's horrible. I only use it to say, if you don't know what intersex is, or you think you've never heard of it, that's the old word that was used to describe them. Don't use it. But more and more people now are coming out and disclosing that they are intersex, that somehow their bodies are different than the ends of the spectrum. And so that's something that I really encourage folks to be, continue to pay attention to, especially doctors, especially people in the fertility space, especially birth workers. So I'll just put that there and really encourage everyone um, to, do, to, to increase your competency around intersex issues. And um, we're not gonna watch it, but there's a really incredible um, BuzzFeed and I'll put it in, I'll just say BuzzFeed, what it's like to be intersex. And then you can just Google that from the chat um, and watch this video and then follow all of those people on social media. Only three of them are on social media, but you should follow them, cool. So the wrap up from this section is, do what you can to learn more about bi non-binary folks. Um, I define allyship as the ability to see the world through multiple lenses. And the way that we do that is really by immersing ourselves in other identities so that we can hone that lens enough that when we're looking at our HR interview paperwork, we know enough that we can say, oh, how might a non-binary person experience this? So you can get to that base level before you, you then can hire a consultant to come in, hopefully who's from the community, who is trans, to come in and look at your paperwork, to look at your benefits, um, to look at your website and make sure that you're using inclusive language, that the photos are inclusive, that it feels um, authentic to the community and not like something that you've just sort of slapped a rainbow logo on. Um, so really digging deep into that work is going to really help. I can't say this enough. It is free to follow intersex and non-binary people on social media. Free for you. Like all of their posts. Comment on all of their posts. Save them. Share them on your stories. Like whatever you can do. That tells the algorithm, the Instagram, the Facebook, the YouTube algorithm, that these are people that other people want to listen to. It's like you're literally unplugging their mic and, and then plugging it into a bigger amp. So that is a free thing that you can do to make sure that they get better, you know, more attention. Also, it sounds totally wild, but when universities are hiring speakers, they look to see how many followers those people have. When editors and publishing companies are giving out book deals, they look to see what your social media following is. So that's an easy, free way that you can make their stories resonate out even more. Um, make sure that you're bringing awareness to any assumptions or bias that you might have, and then practice using gender neutral pronouns until you've mastered them. Oh no. Okay, I'm just doing a time check on myself. We have 11 minutes. So let's go into some allyship pieces. Um, understanding that as you go into your allyship work, you know, if you're a medical provider, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to be really adept in trauma-informed care. And for some people, they're like, yeah, of course. I work with a lot of reproductive endocrinologists uh, who still are like, I don't know what that is. I've never heard of that. So a lot of embryologists, a lot of folks in the more formal medical settings have never heard of trauma-informed care. So if you want to do trans-inclusive work, it's critical that you're using that lens. I'm not gonna go into this too much, other than to say that transgender folks experience way disproportionate bias, discrimination, harassment, abuse in medical settings. Um, and unfortunately, that carries over all the way to employment, housing, um, poverty, incarceration, all of those things. And so that's why it's so important that you're cultivating humility, that you're not trying to impress anybody, that you're not trying to always be right, but instead you wanna meet every trans person where they are and to understand that you're on a journey and you're excited to learn when someone tells you that something that you did or said didn't work for them. Um, so a couple of practical tools and then I'll go into a couple of your questions that you asked specifically. Um, if you do, as an ally, if you do make a mistake, you know, we talked about this a little bit about not going down the shame spiral, but super practically, it's really important that you 
not pretend that you didn't use the wrong pronoun or use uninclusive language, but that you acknowledge that it happened, that you fix it and if appropriate, let someone know, thank you for bringing this to my attention. It's really hard to correct someone. It's really hard to go to your doctor and say, you know, I actually didn't think that your paperwork was appropriate for someone like me. It's hard to do that. And so it's almost always appropriate to say, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. I really appreciate that. Um, and, you know, again, if it isn't something simple like a pronoun, but it is a larger thing, it's also important that you show that you understand why it wasn't okay. You know, to be able to say our aim is to be fully inclusive and to build trust. And I know that we missed the mark here. So really recognizing, right, this is what we expect of celebrities, right, when they like mess up in some big way. We don't want them to be like, I'm sorry if you were offended. You want them to be like, I'm sorry, here's why that was wrong, and here's what I'm going to do differently. Same thing. Here's why it was wrong, and here's what I'm going to do differently. I'm going to make sure that this paperwork gets fixed by the next time you come in. Or I'm on the advisory committee, um, and we're working on our paperwork. It's not going to get fixed in the next six months, but it will get fixed in the next year. So whatever that, whatever that plan is um, to do that. And then make sure that you fix the mistake and don't do it again. Okay, so now we have quite a few practical questions that, I, that I'm going to address because I think it's really important. I'm not going to do this tool. That's for another workshop at another time. Um, boom, boom, boom. Talked about this already. Okay, great. So now let's go to the questions that you have. So the first one, should we require team members to include their pronouns on signatures? Maybe. So here's the practical application. I do a lot of work as a consultant helping organizations get to a place of trans inclusion. So pronouns and signatures are useful and it has to happen in the right way. So what I have seen not work is someone arbitrarily saying everyone needs to include their pronouns and their signatures from now on, period, the end, that's it. That can maybe feel good to you because you're like, ha, we're taking the stance. However, you have to also think about, does every, is everyone being brought along in this process? Does everyone understand why we're doing this? Because if you don't do it that way, if you don't do it as part of a larger conversation and a larger process, people are going to be resentful. They're gonna roll their eyes when they do it. They're going to forget to do it. And then most importantly, they're not going to pay attention to the pronouns of people's signature lines. And then they're still going to use the wrong pronouns for any trans or non-binary staff you might have. So it's important, yes, and it has to be connected to a larger conversation around trans inclusion. Um, and that can happen a lot of different ways. It can happen because an, an LGBT employee resource group pushes for it. It can happen because HR pushes for it. There are lots of ways it can happen, but it has to include as many voices as possible and be connected to this larger conversation so that you're explaining, why are we doing this? Why is this in alignment with our values? What questions do people have? What fears do they have? That there is a, a, a container, a brave, I, I know someone said like, you shouldn't say safe space. I agree, I don't do safe space, I, but I do talk about a brave space, a, a space that, where people feel brave enough to bring their questions, concerns, comments, so that they can really be addressed in the open in a healthy way, so you don't end up with these little pockets of resentment. So yes, they should as part of a larger question, as part of a larger process. Um, people did ask, so then how do I ask pronouns? There's lots of ways to do this. Um, in group settings, there's no one set way that consultants use, but what I recommend is in a group setting to say, you know, now we're going to go around, everyone's going to introduce themselves. Um, and we are going to ask everyone to also share their personal pronoun um, if they care to. And the reason that we do this is that we want everyone on our team to feel that they can bring their most authentic selves. And one of the ways that that doesn't happen for transgender people, non-binary people, gender nonconforming people is that people might assume what their pronoun is instead of just asking. And so we're just going to create a norm that everyone who feels comfortable shares what their pronoun is. So for example, I'm Tristan and I use he, him, his. And also just to let folks know that this isn't a joke, this is something super serious. So we're going to ask no one to make any kind of flippant remarks about this as we go around. So those are the two things that I recommend doing. Why are we doing this? And hey, this is serious, don't make a joke. And if you don't do that, someone will make a joke. 100% of the time, someone's gonna make a joke, gonna be awkward, gonna be painful, then you have to call them out, that's worse, so you just set the norm. Or number two, people feel confused, they don't know what that means, they're not in your social justice bubble, they don't know what the word pronoun means, 
you know, and then, then, then they may say something like, oh, it doesn't matter what you use. And then you have to be like, really? Doesn't that matter, Tracy? Really? I can call you he? Really? You don't want to do that. So you set that container for doing that. And then I think, you know, the final question that I'll address before we wrap up, you know, someone said, um, and, oh, and same thing with pronouns from a job candidate. Totally okay. In the very beginning of the conversation, you're like, so excited to get to know you. I'll start by introducing myself. So I'm Tristan Reese. I'm, you know, I'm the, the chief people officer here. Um, some things to know about me, I'm a vegetarian. Uh, I'm Canadian, I'm a dad. Um, and I use he, him, his pronouns. So what are some things that you want me to know about you before we get started? And you invite them to share. And what you don't wanna do is force someone to, to do it. What you don't wanna do is put anyone on the spot, but you wanna show that this is a norm. I feel comfortable talking about this. I'm ready to hear it from you as well. And then unfortunately, we had a lot of other really complicated questions like, I'm a doctor. How do I ask patients if they're transgender? That is a very complicated question. Um, there's actually Actually, a lot of great data around that though around the best way to ask it that comes from the Fenway Institute um, and so I'm happy for you to reach out to me and I can set you up I have a whole training on trans inclusive and LGBTQ inclusive care that exists digitally happy to connect you with that so yeah thank you so 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 much to kind body I'm gonna share my screen one more time which will just have my my contact details um, so that folks can boop, 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 boop. here we go so you can, um, anyone who wants like future training more on this, you can reach out to me personally on Instagram, I'm Biff and I, my consulting firm is Collaborate Consulting and then you can find me on my website as well and just set up a time to chat. My website is collaborate.consulting, that's actually the web address. Thank you so much to everyone and maybe Kind Body will send out a, a follow up letting them know about their, the amazing work that you're doing and also just a little bit about how to reach me as well. Yes, thank you so much, Tristan. We'll be emailing everybody um, with a link to this so you can take a look. We also have some more events coming up. Uh, tomorrow we have LGBTQ plus family building where we're talking about um, family building options for all. Um, that is 8 p.m. EST, 5 p.m. PST tomorrow. You can sign up on our website. And then next week we have an event on race and fertility. We'll be exploring that topic in detail. Um, that is next Wednesday and also on our website. So thank you, Tristan, that was really incredible. And thank you everybody for joining us. Of course, thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your week, everyone.